these children open the box, they have the opportunity to go through the greatest journey, the 12 lesson discipleship program, where they get to learn more about Jesus Christ. Right now, I'm right outside of Mazlan, Mexico, about six hour drive up in the mountains. This is an indigenous people group, people that never heard the gospel before. The kids and the families that accepted Christ, almost a hundred all together, have now started a church. Hello. Hemos visto una experiencia preciosa, grande, ¿verdad? en el pueblo. Y ese pueblo va a ser el medio no, mira, para llevar el evangelio a otro lugar. Que estas bendiciones que son de las cajitas sigan llegando hacia arriba y a la montaña. This shoebox gives Thank us you. an opportunity to continue to shine the bright light of the gospel in the darkest and remote places around the world. We're seeing families come to know Jesus. Churches are sprouting up in these communities. These children are rising up to be disciples in their own country. The gift box and the gospel of Jesus Christ bring hope to our children to bring the smiles back on their faces. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly. This is what these shoe boxes are all about, to go out in the bring of hope of Jesus Christ around the world. I'm just so amazed at what God does each and every year. This is an opportunity to impact the lives of millions of children, just like you've seen. But we need more boxes for next year. Every box is an opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you, and God bless each and every one. Okay, do we have him on there now? Okay, uh, this is Eves Deschamay. Uh, he was a shoebox recipient, and I'm let you tell. I'll let him tell you his story. Hey, Eves, how are you? <laughs> y'all wait too. Right. Should I say hey, y'all? <laughs> Good evening, y'all. <laughs> say hey, y'all. Yeah. Recording in progress. Thank you. Yes, I am just so excited to be with you guys. Um, um, virtually and in spirit, um, we wish we could have uh, been there in person, but uh, this is the next best thing, and we are grateful to uh, to God for uh, the technology um, that we have to be able to gather uh, and be in communion and in fellowship despite the miles between us. Uh, but by way of introduction, my name is Eve Dushime, and when I was 11 years old, I received the uh, uh, one of these red and green shoe boxes from Operation Christmas Child, and it has radically changed my life forever. I've never been the same. I received my shoe box gift living in the country of Togo in West Africa, but that's not where I'm originally from. Uh, my family is originally from the country of uh, Rwanda. Uh, now, I know the moment I mentioned Rwanda, uh, many of your uh, thoughts went to uh, one of the most defining events, uh, really, in the history of humanity, and that is the Rwandan genocide. And uh, the Rwandan genocide is at the core of who I am. Uh, everything I came to be uh, while I was a refugee for 16 years, and in a way, still am a refugee to this very day. Um, so I couldn't possibly convey uh, the full meaning, uh, the complete meaning of this shoebox. If I, if I didn't go backwards, uh, all the way back to Rwanda. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, in case you're not familiar, the Rwandan genocide was a, uh, was a power conflict uh, sparked by a, a struggle between two ethnic groups, the Hutus on one side and the Tutsis on the other. And for generations, these two groups uh, struggled. Um, they struggled to really get along, but they always found ways to make it work. Uh, and their struggle, the, 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 the tension really stemmed from uh, factors dating all the way back to the colonial, uh, colonial era. But I'm not going to go that far back. Uh, but what I will mention is they always found ways to make it work. Hutus and Tutsis, these two main tribes in Rwanda, uh, despite that, found, you know, they always found uh, compromises along the way. However, in 1994, one of the groups got their hands 
on surface-to-air missiles, which they went and used uh, to shoot down the president's plane. Now, when this happened, um, it was the single event, the single catalyst that led to the aftermath, what we came to know um, today as the Rwandan genocide. When the president's plane went down, uh, he, his family, and his entire cabinet uh, were killed. Um, On, on his aircraft. Um, and the moment that went down, his military started cracking down on uh, the people that were sympathetic to the cause of the people that shot down his plane. And one thing led to the next. And within the first 100 days, one million people had been killed. Now, it's taken me a bit of a hard time to get to that point. Um, because of how heavy it is uh, emotionally and mentally. Because among that million of my family members, I've never gotten the chance to, uh, to meet my, um, my grandfathers. I've never gotten the chance to meet my grandmothers. Um, I've never met my uncles, my cousins. So outside of my mom, my dad, and my siblings, I've ever met my mom's little, I've only ever met my mom's little sister. Everyone else was killed. Um, in 1994 and the, the years that followed for the crime of being born in an ethnic group we didn't choose to be born into. And, you know, I'm sharing these details because I want you to understand the kind of mental state I grew up in as a kid, the kind of uh, mental space um, I had to endure um, uh, in a refugee camp. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in a refugee camp or perhaps seen pictures of a refugee camp. Maybe we have one uh, that we're able to share with you guys today. Um, but to try and describe it, it was just an empty field in the woods where people would go and find pieces of woods. Uh, we would find pieces like trunks of trees uh, in the woods and bury them in the ground, at least four sticks in each corner, uh, find pieces of plastic, put that together. And that was our tarp and that was our roof. That's uh, uh, that, that concluded our house and we would sleep in the dirt. And in that dirt is where I was born. And uh, from a very young age, I began to realize that our family uh, nucleus was very different from everyone else's. And I began to ask the questions, you know, I needed to make sense of uh, why uh, my family dynamics were different from everybody else, why we had so few people in my own family. And as I grew up, my family began to explain to me what had happened. And uh, it didn't make sense to me because I, I was trying to, uh, you know, from a young age, I've always rationalized, try to find logic and things. So it didn't make sense for me that people lost their lives for a choice they never had. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they, one million people uh, were killed for a choice they never made. You don't choose where you're born. Uh, you don't choose what tribe you belong to. And for the life of me, I could not figure out why people would take up weapons uh, and go slaughter men, uh, innocent men, women, and children. Um, and on top of that, for a choice they never had. But I needed to understand, I needed to make sense of it all. So I started reading any uh, articles I could find, any journals, any um, testimonials, something that could shed some light into how what happened was allowed to happen and, 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 and what caused it and, and how it all went down. But in my quest for answers, y'all, I didn't find any. None that were good enough. Um, and that left me brokenhearted. It left me uh, angry. But more than that, it left me with a... Uh, with a radical hatred for humanity. Uh, and I mean that in the most literal way possible. I hated the world, okay? Um, I hated Rwandans, uh, people from Rwanda, because of what they had done. But to me, the entire world was culpable, okay? Because the entire world stood idly by for 100 days while a million people lost their lives and they did absolutely nothing to try and stop it until it was too late. I hated the world and um, the hatred in my heart just consumed every bit of who I was. And the truth is, I saw no way out. Um, what makes this uh, story, my life story, even more interesting is the fact that I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my mom and dad are pastors, okay? Uh, any PKs in the house, any pastor's kids, maybe uh, missionary kids, um, 
maybe pastors themselves. There's got to be a pastor in the church right now, right? There he is. <laughs> um, you know, as a, as a pastor kid, you had sort of different expectations of yourself. And um, I never once wanted to be identified as one because of my hardened heart. And I remember growing up, uh, you know, and as a young kid, just full of so much anger. My, my dad would always try to tell me this and he would use these specific words, Eve, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. And... Uh, those words almost triggered me in a way, and they triggered me because of this reason. Um, contrary to popular belief, in what happened in the Rwandan genocide, if you were to look at a Hutu and a Tutsi uh, side by side, there were no physical identifiers. There, was, there, there were no physical characteristics that could help you uh, decidedly identify who was a Hutu and who was a Tutsi. You couldn't just look at someone the way you can look at me and Pastor Barry and say, okay, these two people belong to di two different ethnic groups. There, were no way, uh, there was no way to tell who was who. And you didn't carry uh, an identity card that wrote down your tribe. You didn't carry a passport that had uh, your tribe name on there. And the point I'm trying to make is this. The only way for people who did the killing to know who to kill is if they knew them beforehand. It was friends that killed friends. It was neighbors that killed neighbors. Therefore, my father told me, Eve, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. I would look at him and say, Dad, that is absolute nonsense. How could you expect me to love the very people that killed your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sister? And, 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 and for, for, for the longest time, there was this battle inside of me uh, where, where hatred, where darkness, where anger, where, where bitterness, where the need to find some some sort of revenge uh, consistently conquered any potential for good, for, for, for positivity, for love, for compassion, for empathy in me. The hatred in my heart consumed every bit of who I was and I saw no way out. But uh, y'all, I am before you today. I am seated here uh, before you because God made a way, okay? And he used somebody just like you. Um, to get me to who I am today by packing, uh, use that someone to just pack a simple shoebox gift and change my life forever, radically. And some of you may be looking around thinking, Eve, I thought these things were just Christmas gifts full of, you know, pens, pencils, uh, soaps and, and washcloths. How could that possibly have an impact? such a profound impact on your heart. Well, let me tell you how. When I opened up my shoebox at the very top, there was a sticky note. Okay, you all know what a sticky note is, right? And on that sticky note were three lines. The first line said, God loves you. The second, Jesus loves you. And the third just wrecked me. The third said these words, it said, I love you. Now, the reason why that last line mattered as much as it did is because for the first time in my entire life, I was faced with an I love you from a member of that very humanity that I had grown to despise and sworn to despise for the rest of my life. And this person, wherever they were, were telling me essentially, Eve, despite your hatred for me, I love you anyway. And here is proof of my love for you, my tangible uh, uh, love for you. Uh, in the form of the first and only gift that you've ever received. I was 11 years old. I'd never received a, a Christmas gift. I'd never received a birthday gift because of the nature of the, of the poverty that we grew up in. And here was an ordinary man or woman out there in this world that I perceived as so broken, telling me that they love me anyway. That sticky note wrecked me. Okay, God shook my world to the core with that sticky note. He wrecked me into pieces so he would build me back up in the way that he intended there is a reason why it's called being born again, okay? Because he picks up our broken pieces and begins to rebuild this brand new uh, image, this brand new thing, this brand new uh, creation in the way that he intended. I have never been the same. God began to rid me of all that anger, of all that pain, of all that brokenness, and started making some room in my, in my heart for love and compassion simply by reminding me of a couple of things. One, if this, uh, if a member of that broken humanity as I perceived them, which is the only reason why I was able to justify hating them in the radical way that I did, if this member of that very broken humanity could demonstrate this kind of tangible love towards me, perfect me, which is how I justified hating them because I was better than them, if they could do such a thing, then one, what was my excuse? 
if you claim to be better than they are, and they are doing such a thing, then what is your excuse? And two, if this broken humanity, as I perceived it, could demonstrate this kind of tangible love towards me, a total stranger, then how much greater must our Father in Heaven's love for me be? That love has um, has rescued me from uh, the burden of, of hatred that I carried with me my entire life. And I have never been the same. And he used God, our, our merciful, loving God, used a sticky note to do just that. The point I'm trying to make uh, is this. The main point I'm trying to make is this. Every single day, all around this planet, God is using random objects, <laughs> you know, in these boxes all across this planet uh, to bring hope to people who have lost it. And you are a part of doing that. Um, every single year, simply by packing the shoebox, simply by championing uh, the, the, the shoebox ministry, perhaps um, as a, as a year-round volunteer, perhaps volunteering at a drop-off uh, drop location or a central drop-off. God is using you in mighty ways. And my point uh, being that is because if God can use a, a, a sticky note uh, to redeem a kid who has heard the gospel thousands of times. Okay, I heard it in Sunday school. I heard it at church multiple times a week. I was a pastor's kid. We lived in the church. Despite my hearing this, the gospel so many times, it never reached me. And God used the sticky note uh, to get through to me. So if he can use a tiny piece of paper to do such a work around the world, can I just ask you today, uh, what is your excuse? Why can't he use the gifts that he's placed inside of you? Perhaps some of you in the in the audience today are incredible bargain shoppers. Uh, did you know that by walking into Walmart or the Dollar Tree or whatever store you shop at and go look for these incredible deals on on uh, on pens and pencils and and paper and and and, and toys and 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 bars of soaps and and walking out with that cart full of so many things. Did you know that was an act of worship? Because when you get home and you pack that shoebox and you send it across the world, you are a missionary in the field without ever having to set foot on a plane. And if God can do such miraculous things with sticky notes all around the world, I can only imagine what he can do with the many gifts that he's placed inside of you. And uh, God... Um, found a way to get through to me in his own time and uh the crazy thing is i wasn't the only one the the, the community where i grew up in in togo um uh anyone ever heard of togo by the way before i go on a show of hands i can see you guys you guys have heard of togo okay not everybody thank you for your honesty uh <laughs> togo is a tiny little country in 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 west africa uh between, between Ghana and Benin and uh, near the likes of Nigeria and the Ivory Coast, perhaps you've heard of some of those other bigger countries. Uh, Togo is a small country, about 9 million people in its entire population. And probably the most uh, notable thing is, is Togo is among one of the poorest countries on the planet. And when I say poor, I mean poor, okay? I'm a, a different kind of poor. I'm not talking... Um, um, America poor. We have a different kind of poverty in this country. Um, and hear me out, I'm not saying there's no poverty in America. Of course there, there is. Uh, we just have a different kind of poverty uh, in this country. And uh, Togo has certainly had a different kind of poverty. And, and I'm talking about the poverty where um, I grew up with kids who couldn't go to school simply because they couldn't afford a pack of pencils. Okay, and I know that sounds insane. Because y'all can go to the Dollar Tree. Y'all have the Dollar Tree, right? Show of hands. You got the Dollar Tree in town? That's my favorite place to go, okay? This place is amazing, okay? No ifs and buts about it. Everything is a dollar. No one can tell you otherwise. 
everything is a dollar. So I love walking into that place and grabbing my cart and just trekking along all the aisles and it's small enough that you can go through the whole thing in less than 30 minutes. And I love stuffing my uh, my cart with all the things from my shoebox. And oftentimes I get to the cash register with like 10 pairs of flip-flops and the cashier looks at me and he's like, dude, are you okay? What's going on? And then I get to tell them about shoeboxes. So anyway, my point is this, we can go to the to the Dollar Tree, buy a pack of pencils for one dollar and be able to use it for the rest of the year. But yeah, some of you guys with younger kids could probably go home, maybe with grandkids, uh, go in your living rooms and find enough school supplies in your couches, okay, in your couch cushions, you know, where the remotes live uh, and be able to supply entire schools with stuff from your couch. That is the kind of wealth we have in this country to the point where we just forget about all these things hidden and tucked away elsewhere. You know, I grew up brushing my teeth with pieces of sticks. And we have, a, I have a picture with me if we're able to put up that slide um, of, of these bunches of sticks in a, in a bucket being sold on the market. And these were our toothbrushes because we couldn't afford uh, something as simple as a toothbrush. You know, there you go, there, there it is, right there. These were toothbrushes that we would use uh, to, to brush our teeth. And if we go uh, maybe one, uh, one slide behind you know, growing up as a kid, I always wanted a, 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 a toy car, but we couldn't afford that. So we would resolve to this. Uh, this year is, I believe, is a Ford, uh, Ford F-150. Um, I, have one, I have one with me right now. If we didn't get that picture going, I, I would have shown you this, uh, this, this, this puppy right here. Uh, you, know, you like that truck bed, you know? So those, those of you on the Zoom, perhaps, you know, you tie a little piece of string on it and you, you've got yourself... Uh, a fancy toy car, but you know, in my household, we weren't allowed to park our cars in, indoor because you know our, our house was a tiny little room, so we had to leave it outside. And when you're right, you had to start over again. It was this whole thing with our mom. Don't get me started. But this is the kind of poverty I'm talking about. Do y'all know how blessed we are in this country? Show of hands, how blessed we are in this country. We are so blessed, you know. And and if you don't, if you if you don't, uh, if you haven't you know, sort of grasped that or maybe been reminded of that in a while. Um, let me ask you this question. Uh, anyone ever thought about the concept of storage units? You know, storage units. Ever think about those and how insane they are? <laughs> okay, in case you haven't, let me break it down for you. We have so much stuff in this country that we are willing to pay somebody else our hard-earned money on a monthly basis to store the stuff that we don't need on a daily basis. Let me say that again. <laughs> we have so much stuff that we are willing to pay someone else on a monthly basis to store the stuff that we don't need on a daily basis. It's insane. And if you have a storage unit, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty over here, especially if that storage unit is for Operation Christmas Child stuff. I personally have a storage unit, so I'm not trying to blame you, you know, or make you feel guilty in any way. We are just so blessed in this country. But the community I grew up in in Togo, when they heard that there was somebody out there uh, sending 300 shoebox gifts to our church, um, it changed everything. Because the kind of poverty we grew up in, the only way out was to to go to school, get an education, um, get, your, get your diploma and go into the big city and show it off to, to the big employers. So they would give you a job, a well-paying job, so you could go back into your village and lead your family out of poverty. The only way out of poverty was through education. But the school system did not allow a single kid to step into a classroom if they couldn't show that they had their own school supplies. And to put this into context, furthermore, a one American dollar is the equivalent of 500 plus of their currency in Togo. You can look that up when you get home today. So imagine having to spend 500 bucks on a pack of pencil. It's just unattainable. But when this community heard that the church had 300 boxes, every single one of them was school supplies, it got their attention. Now, this community, beyond being ravaged by uh, physical poverty, struggled with a spiritual kind of poverty as well. And that had to do with the witchcraft presence uh, in the community, the, the witch doctors and uh, the black magic, the voodoo, whatever you want to call it. And by the way, witchcraft is real. 
And the reason why witchcraft is real is because the devil is real. Okay, and these witch doctors could harness that power and be able to use it to heal just as much as to kill. And I saw it with my very own eyes. And um, for, for generations, they had uh, persecuted the people of Togo, the people of our very own village, and told them never to set foot in the church which made it really interesting, especially because these witch doctors told them that the Christian folks were the enemy um, and that if they were seen at the church, they would lose their lives. Okay, they, Their lives were literally threatened. Um, and this made it quite interesting for a new family of pastors that just moved into town. And my dad was all excited about, you know, yeah, being a missionary in town and, and spreading the gospel. But for years, he tried to minister to the people of Togo and it didn't work for years. Until, until the year of th uh, 2005. Uh, and somebody called the church and I'm like, yeah, we got the stuff. Um, all of them have um, toy cars, uh, pencils, pens, uh, notebooks, toothbrushes. And this is back when you could send toothpaste and candy. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> Look, we didn't have cell phones back in the day, but the word spread fast. People found out quickly that the church had their hands on school supplies, which would, uh, which had the potential of changing the trajectory of their children's lives forever by giving them a chance at an education. Now, the church um, was ready to distribute things. However, the people uh, to whom they wanted to, to, to share these things with were in a bit of a dilemma. Um, the witch doctors had told them never to set foot on the church threatened their lives, uh, but they also had a chance to change their kids' futures forever. Now, I don't know about any of you uh, parents in the in the room um, tonight, uh, but every family chose their kids. They decided to defy the witch doctor's orders and went to the church to get a gift that would allow their children to have a chance at a future. But what they didn't expect was the fact that whenever they got there, there was an even greater gift waiting for them. It was a gift that never fades. It was a gift that, that, that will never wither. It was a gift that will never run out in the same way pens do. And the best thing yet, it was a gift that was free and available to every single one of them. And that is the gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And every single person that day was able to hear how we serve a God who was so powerful, so much more powerful than any of the other witch doctors they'd ever cowered to in the past. Uh, and, and yet so loving that he, he sent his one and only son uh, to come on earth. Uh, live amongst us, teach us not only that, but to go die on a cross. So not only we as believers, but they as witchcraft followers would have an opportunity uh, at salvation. Not only we, but they would have an opportunity uh, at redemption and forgiveness from all their sins. Not only we as believers, but they could have an opportunity at eternal life. Are you tracking with me here? Have I lost you? <laughs> For the first time in generations, pastors and witch doctors were under the same roof and nobody died. For the first time in generations, uh, the barrier that separated uh, witchcraft followers and pastors and, and Christians and believers, that barrier was torn down. And God used 300 of these things to bring down that barrier so the gospel will be preached for the first time ever. If God can, do, if God can use 300 boxes full of stuff from the Dollar Tree to do such an incredible thing. What can God do with the gifts that he's placed inside each and every single one of you? You know, um, months went by and one day, uh, one of those very witch doctors that had threatened my family for so long um, came knocking at our doorstep and he literally walked up to uh, at the corner of the village where we lived and uh, we were terrified because we figured he's there to make good on his promise to kill us all. Uh, but when, his, when he opened up his mouth, this is what we heard. Uh, Pastor Jean-Baptiste, that's my father's name. I have come here today because I have realized that your God is so much stronger than, than my God. And I am here to give my life to your Jesus. In fact, we have a picture of it. If you could just pop that up on the screen. Um, this witch doctor who had spent so many of, of his years uh, trying to 
um, break down that guy right there in the middle there. Uh, and there's my father on the left-hand side leading them in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and he had brought his wife and his two younger kids. Uh, and, and I know I'm supposed to be sharing my story, and I'm talking about some witch doctor, but this guy's story needs to be told. Because I don't know if you can tell, but behind him, there's a bunch of people there. Uh, now, this is my courtyard on my house, okay, where we lived. These people didn't live there in the back of it. But they had come because they heard that the lead witch doctor was hanging out with the very people that he had forbidden everybody else from hanging out with. And they came to figure out what that was all about. And guess what that turned into? It turned into an outreach event. It turned into a, a, a crusade, an, an event. When, when Operation Christmas Child talks about evangelism, this is what they're talking about. When Operation Christmas Child talks about discipleship, these are the stories that they're talking about. Because this man and the weeks that follow, let's jump to the next picture here. This is a picture perfect of him surrendering his entire life to God. Uh, if we could jump to that next slide, uh, 11 there. Uh, if you look there, this is a man who had never bowed down to anything or anyone else. And he is on, the, on his knees, okay, surrendering his life to our Jesus. And my, my father is uh, uh, praying uh, over them but i want you to focus on the bottom left uh corner there those things you see on the ground and there were plenty more to the side those those things were his witchcraft tools his voodoo items uh, that he had brought in heavy bags and dragged them from his house all the way to mine and he told my father pastor john baptiste i want you to light these things on fire. i want you to burn them okay and i want people to publicly see that i have decided to follow your Jesus. guys this would be the equivalent all of all of us grabbing all of our Bibles, all of our devotionals, all of our journals, everything uh, that, that, that we can associate with our Jesus, taking it into the town square and burning them. There is no turning back from that. And this man knew that fact because he had decided to become a disciple. This is what Operation Christmas Child talks about. And they talk about discipleship. And I know I'm supposed to be talking about, you know, my story and, and sharing things about me, but this guy's story needs to be told. Because in the weeks that followed, he began going into the homes of the very people that he persecuted. He was bringing them the gospel. You know, he was saying, look, I'm so sorry for everything I've caused. Please forgive me. I have found another way. I have found a better way. Can I tell you about him? I found the only way. And he was sharing Jesus with the very people that he had persecuted. You know, one day he came to our house, as he so often did. Um, just dropped by unannounced because we didn't have phones, of course. Uh, and he often came around dinner time. My brothers and I kind of figured out and we thought, okay, maybe he just likes my mom's cooking. Uh, but he came to our house and <laughs> he was like, oh, Pastor Jean Baptiste, I've been reading up on this thing called baptism. Uh, can you tell me more about that? And my dad told him, yeah, you know, it's a public declaration of faith. It's a symbolic dying to our old selves and a renewal and a rebirth in Christ. And he was like, well, am I eligible? And my dad said, of course, you know, so they set up a time and a date uh, to go to the local river. And if we could go back to that, to that slide, the next photo here, whenever they got there, this happened. <sighs> Can you see how far back that line goes? It goes on and on and on and on. And I have a monitor here. Uh, where I'm just looking at these people just lined up, uh, getting ready to be baptized. And the next slide is my dad in the water, <laughs> uh, baptizing them right there on the right-hand side. But let's, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that picture of all the people. None of these people ever got shoeboxes, but their lives had been transformed forever. In fact, these people uh, came to plant three new churches because of the crowds in the villages and where they were coming from. Three new churches were planted in my community in different villages nearby. And those churches are still standing to this very day. This is what Operation Christmas Child talks about when they refer to multiplication. You are a missionary uh, across this world, uh, serving Christ in incredible ways, simply by packing Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes. And if you're sitting today here and you're thinking, Eve, uh, perhaps I want to do more. There are so many opportunities for you to do more. If, you, if you've packed shoeboxes for many years and you never really understood uh, the depth of what God does with this ministry around the world and you want to do more, we would love to talk to you. 
uh, to talk to uh, anyone with one of these on their on their shirts today, and they'd be glad to get you uh, hooked up. But before I leave here, I want to um, show you the only item I have left uh, of my of my shoebox um, uh, 16 years ago now. I still have it. Uh, the day I received my shoebox, this was my second least favorite item in my box after that sticky note. That thing was the worst because it convicted me, uh, but it was the most powerful thing. And this year was my second least favorite item, and you'll know why when you see it. Um, can anyone tell me what this is? Yeah, this here is a scarf, okay? It's not a trick question, but can anyone tell me where I live? I lived in... <laughs> Uh, I, I lived in, in 95 degree heat. Um, we had no idea what this piece of cloth with absolutely no personality was. In fact, as 11 year old kids, we began to wonder, you know, where are the holes for your arms or your legs? We didn't know what it was. Uh, but Eve being the businessman that he's been ever since he was a kid, you know, I you know, walked up with my swagger, you know, put it on my chest and I walked to the other kids and I was like, guys, look, look what I got in my box. I bet none of you guys had one of these in your shoe boxes. And they're like, yeah, no, we didn't. And I was like, well, guess what? Uh, for the right price, I am let, willing to let this thing go. You know, two pencils and I will let this thing go. They all laughed in my face. You get out of here. We don't need that. And I thought, you know, my brothers, because they're my brothers, I could tap into that brotherly love and get them to trade for something better. And they all laughed in my face. I was stuck with this useless piece of cloth but I was determined to find purpose for it so I hung it in my house and once in a while I put it to use and I uh, put it to use bandaging my leg often when I would get hurt playing soccer this was my first aid kit and I would put it back on the on the wall when it would get better but fast forward three years after I received my shoebox gift uh, my family is resettled through a United Nations refugee resettlement program and look the way it works is they choose where they send you you don't get to choose they choose for you if we if we had gotten to choose we wouldn't be in a place uh, where we are under hurricane uh, watch at the moment <laughs> or, or uh, uh, they sent us to Buffalo New York people okay the frozen tundras of upstate New York and I remember stepping off that plane uh, on October 29th 2008 and uh, being hit by air so cold, we had never thought it was possible. <laughs> uh, look, we didn't have AC, we didn't have fridges growing up, so our skins had literally never felt air that cold. And as we got off the plane right there on the tarmac and walking towards the terminal, something clicked in my head. As all of us were shivering and my brothers were shivering, and my parents were like, okay, what is this thing? I remember I packed something in my backpack and nobody else had. So I gently to proceeded to you know, pull out my scarf, you know, and wrapped it around my neck with all the sass in the world. And I looked at my brothers and I was like, that's fine. Who's laughing now? You know, I was on top of the world. You know, this <laughs> it's only lasted a couple of minutes because when we got into the terminal, there were people there with hats and, and gloves and scarves and coats and everything we needed to keep warm. But uh, in those two minutes, I was on top of the world. And looking back, I am reminded of how powerful uh, of a reminder this is. This is a powerful reminder reminder this is uh, the most valuable item i own today because it is a powerful reminder of god's sovereignty in our lives and in my life this is a reminder that he knew my past he knew the burdens of hatred um, that i carried in my heart and he used the sticky note to rid me of that um, and in our present as my father was struggling to minister to witch doctors and share the gospel in places where it had never been shared. He, he knew our presence and he delivered 300 of these so we'd be able to do just that. In the same way he knew my past, my present, uh, he knew my future. And this is a powerful reminder of that. So if you take anything away uh, from, from the rambling I have just gone on for the last 34 minutes or so, uh, please let it be this. On behalf of uh, on behalf of the 190 million plus of us all across this world who have been impacted directly by an Operation Christmas Shot shoebox, thank you for who you are. Um, but more than that, I want to extend a challenge that I am partaking in myself, and that is this. Uh, the world has suffered so much in the last 18 months or so, and we live in virtually one of the wealthiest communities, uh, wealthiest societies, uh, wealthiest nations on the planet 
And if we have suffered as much as we have, can you imagine how places in India, Africa, Latin America, South America, how they're faring? How places like Togo are faring? Now more than ever, uh, hope is needed all across the world. And these here are full of hope. They're, they're vessels of hope all across this world. And you, me, we can be a part of sharing that hope all across this world. Look, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, how you were raised, what creed, what faith you claim to belong to, what race, ethnicity you claim to belong to. Everyone understands hope. Hope is universal. Everyone needs and understands hope. And uh, the thing is, us as believers, we know that hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And you, me, all of us can be a part of sharing that hope all across this world. And if you think, Eve, I don't know how I can do that. You know, my reminder is this. If God can use a sticky note to change my heart forever, if God can use shoeboxes to bring witch doctors to him, uh, you know, what is your excuse? What is my excuse? None of us have an excuse. So my challenge is this. If you packed two boxes last year, why don't you double that number to four? If you as a family packed five, I want you to, I want you to take on this challenge. Uh, if you packed five, do 10 this year. If you, as a church or a group or a book club or whatever it is, if you packed 50 boxes last year, I want to exchange, uh, extend the, the, the challenge to you. And why don't you pack 100? And I know as the numbers are going up, you're like, Eve, come on, nine dollars per box, 50 boxes, 100 boxes, that becomes a lot of money. Well, uh, let me encourage you and leave you with this. This verse has become one of my favorite uh, verses, passages, it's become a mantra. It's in Proverbs and it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on what? your own understanding forget everything you think you know about math and nine dollars times this and just trust in god uh take that step of faith and he will make your path straight may god bless you and thank you so so much pastor recording stopped uh i guess maybe you can see me now uh, I can. but it's good to <laughs> Uh, man, what a wonderful testimony. I know we may have a few folks here tonight that uh, have a few questions, and I know Miss Linda had kind of had one that we wanted to ask. And so uh, I'd like to just ask, give us just uh, a little information of how you got involved with uh, Samaritan's Purse slash Operation Christmas Child. I know you received a box as a child, but what did it uh, process go through to be where you are now, uh, able to share with many churches and yeah. And uh, just doing what you're doing, because you did a great job, and you're a great ambassador for uh, for Samaritan's Purse and Operations Christmas Child. But tell us how you made that connection. Uh, how much time we got? A week? Two days? It's On Central a long time. Story. <laughs> we're behind you already. It's we're good. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, when I went to um, I went to college in Philadelphia. I, I went to business school there, and. Uh, I remember one of, uh, uh, there was one event, it was a community outreach event, um, and a bunch of groups for, from the community had sort of come in to, 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 uh, onto campus to uh, spread the word on what they were doing, their projects, and also recruit volunteers. And this is 2015, uh, so 10 years after I received my shoebox, and I hadn't seen any of this anywhere ever since that, that, uh, that time back in Togo when we got our boxes. And I remember going into this, uh, this, 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 this ballroom and turned uh, the corner right after entering. And there were a stack of like red and green shoeboxes. And I'm like, oh my goodness, is this what I think it is? Uh, but I needed to be sure. And as I got closer and closer, I saw this logo. Now, this logo, there's nothing like it on the planet. There is, there's not. This is one of a kind. Okay, and these red and green shoe boxes are absolutely one of a kind. So I walked up to them, you know, with a high degree of confidence. I knew who they were, but I wanted to make sure. And the gentleman that greeted me was Will Shaw, and uh, he and Amy Shaw are uh, regional area coordinators in the greater Philly area. Uh, he began to explain to me how, you know, you would go. Uh, you would grab a box, choose what age to pack for, and you would go into the store, the Dollar Tree he mentioned, the Walmart, and all these other places, and you would shop with school supplies and hygiene items and all this stuff, and you would send it you know, to, to, to kids across the world. And the whole time, he's giving me his sales pitch. 
Um, I am so moved, uh, so shaken that I'm in tears because um, I found them. I found the people. Uh, I found the people that God used to change my life. And, um, I'm in tears. So he's thinking, what's going on? So he asked me, did I offend you? I'm like, no, I, I'm sorry for the emotion, but I got a shoebox when I was a kid and it changed my life. He lost his mind, ran to the back, called about everybody. And I just started hugging some necks. I, I started hugging everybody in, in the back there, people that I had never met, but it felt like a joyful reunion uh, just with people I had never met. Uh, and they were there to recruit volunteers. So I signed my name on that uh, volunteer seat without even knowing uh, what I was signing up for. But it ended up being uh, just doing a lot of heavy lifting for this couple um, all around uh, the Pennsylvania area. We would go to events and festivals and I would run the booth, pass out pamphlets, encourage people to pack shoeboxes. Uh, one day, about a couple months after we started doing this, he asked me to come up with him uh, during announcements at a church we were uh, sharing at and um, they asked me to come up and just tell people what it meant for me to get a shoebox. He had about three minutes on the on the stage and uh, I told him, no, no way, I'm not going up there. You're crazy man. I uh, said, no thanks. So he was like, okay, you know, no harm, no foul. Uh, so we went on and the next event he asked me again. I was like, wait a minute, didn't I just tell you last week that I have stage fright and I'm not going up there? He's like, yeah, you're right, you're right, you told me. Next event, he asked me again, the crazy guy. Uh, <laughs> I kept saying no, and he kept asking, and eventually I figured out what he was doing. He just needed to get a yes out of me. And I thought, you know, maybe if I give him a yes one time, he'll just gonna, he's just going to let this go. So uh, I decided to get up there at, at, at another church with him months later, and um, uh, I shared, you know, just for a couple of minutes what it meant for me. And at the end of that service, about 12 ladies from a book club uh, approached my booth right I was behind that table where I was most comfortable and um, they began to share with me that for years they packed shoe boxes years and years and they wrote so many letters um, and they showed me pictures of all the things they sent and all the letters they sent um, never once in the many many years they packed did they ever hear anything back from anyone so they figured, look, our work really, and this, you know, it's not really making an impact. Nobody is writing back to us, nothing. They were never getting any affirmation for the work that they were doing. So for the previous three years, um, they had stopped packing shoeboxes and, and, and uh, started focusing on other things. And, uh, and they told me in their words that I was um, an affirmation, a confirmation um, that what they did mattered and they would never stop packing shoe boxes again. And those ladies to this very day are, are packing shoe boxes and every season they send me shoe boxes of their packing parties and things like that. And that day I walked back on, on campus um, encouraged, but also a little full of shame because I had said no um, to affirming dozens of other groups because of my own fears. That was the day, the passage, uh, lean not on your own understanding came to life to me. I stopped thinking about my fears of, of, of being in front of people or whatever else it might be that was a detriment or that was an uh, obstruction to just stepping out in faith and, and affirming what God is doing around the world. And uh, I started doing it. And sure enough, at the end of that year, um, people at headquarters had Operation Christmas Child, you know, started hearing about this African kid who was going around the Philly area and telling his story and inviting people to pack shoeboxes and people were joining in and packing and the numbers were growing and they figured they needed to track down this kid. So uh, um, in the spring of that following year, they, they find my email somehow and uh, a lady at headquarters sent me a, um, an, an email asking me for my full name so they would you know, buy me a plane ticket so I would fly to headquarters and uh, be introduced to the group. And um, I thought it was a Nigerian prince trying to steal my identity, so I sent it to the junk junk box. Uh, but the following week, that lady sent me another email. <laughs> and uh, eventually I found out that she was real and I flew over there. And um, that was 2015, 2016. And uh, here we are seven years later. Uh, just, I'm just passionate. Uh, about um, affirming uh, what you guys do um, uh, because it matters. It really matters. I, this is just one, this, this is just one box. You know, we have so much focus every year. 
and for good reason. You know, we never have enough shoe boxes, uh, which is why I extended that challenge to you to, to double your numbers. But we have this focus on growing the numbers so we can reach as many people as possible. That oftentimes, that in the noise, we forget that all it takes for a whole life to change is one of these, just one. You know, all it takes, all it took in my life is one. Uh, so when we focus on that, on that one, on that the ability to change that one life, uh, I think it matters that more, much more to me. So I'm just uh, determined to encourage as many people as I can, Pastor. That's yeah, the short I... version, by the way. <laughs> Anybody else with a question? This is your uh, one opportunity. But if you've got a question, I'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, over here. I, I can I can see you now. You can see me. All right. I can see you. Yes. All right. Uh, in 2012 and 2014, I'm having to read this from my daughter. She went oh, to okay. Togo. And uh, no uh, if I can pronounce this right, I went with Koku, and we were in Lome Village. And I'm, I, that's where I, I grew up. That was my daughter. You? That's you, where I grew up. I grew up in Lume. Oh, man. I was thinking. When no I was way. Out, how awesome was that? Where uh, is she? The what? Where is she? She is a nurse with a hospital wing. She was at, come from Baseball Church at that time, Baseball First Baptist. And uh, wow. this is what she did. Uh, she did a Bible school in 2012, a uh, young person's retreat in 2014, and a soccer championship in 2014. No way. That is, that is so cool. That is incredible. Is she here? Is no. She there? Uh, she's working, and I, while, yeah. <laughs> while you was talking, I was uh, doing all of this. And I'm, uh, in 2015, she delivered her own personal shoebox to... Transiza, T A N Z A N I A. I'm not oh, sure Tanzania. what that is. Yeah, no, Tanzania. It's a country right. in. Tan uh, yes, Tanzania. And yeah. You're saying you're changed, and I can see it, but she was changed yeah. also. Uh, for her to, to grow up in a kind of sheltered area, and I was on the fire department as a medic, and, and she saw some of the bad stuff, but she never, the change was when the first trip, and she gave all her clothes away. She come back with an empty suitcase, and she says, I'm going back next year. So it changes us on this side, too. Uh, so do what you do. Preach it, because it does make a difference in us and you. How awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. What's your name and what's her name? I want to remember. Is it Melanie? Yes. Melanie Stallings. I know yes. her. Of course Nina knows her. Miss Nina <laughs> knows everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Charles Blaylock. Charles, so good yes. to meet you, my brother. Thank you How for awesome taking is the that? time to share that. That, that is awesome. Uh, it's so uh, nice to meet you. Yes. yes. The same. And what's your yes. name? My name is Nina. She, she and I are friends. Oh, Nina awesome. Bolden. Well, you you know how everybody. she was changed then. <laughs> how awesome. Wow. wow. I think we have a picture of his family. Uh, I'd like to show that for the people and let him speak on that, please. That was one on the slide. Oh, my family. Yes, your family. Oh, oh, oh I thought you were talking about Mr. Charles. <laughs> uh, yeah, th these are my um, these are my people uh, in Buffalo, New York. In the middle, there is Dad, uh, a little more, uh, a little older than what you saw in some of the other photos. Uh, on the right, there is my my baby sister. She's not so little anymore. Her name is Yvette. Um, so like Eve, Yvette. 
crazy, I know. She was born and was very bitter because I was the youngest in the family and then she showed up, ruined the party and then took my name. Can you believe that? Uh, but she's my favorite and she knows it. Uh, don't tell the other ones. Uh, on the left-hand side is my mom. Uh, her name is Kezia. Uh, and uh, she's my personal hero because of all the things that she has just done for our family. I could be here all week. Um, and at the top there, on the other side, just flanking me in the middle there are my brothers Patrick on the right. Patrick is finishing law school in D.C. Um, and uh, there's me in the middle with my throat grown out. <laughs> and on the left is my brother Fidel. Fidel is actually an, uh, he's an OB. He's a doctor in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. I was really uh, looking forward to spending time in Mississippi so I could, you know, do a little turn and go visit this week. But uh and we couldn't we couldn't pull that off, but yeah, this is my family in Buffalo, New York at Christmas time, uh, a couple of years back. And if you go to the slide three, maybe people can get a better idea of what Charles Charles knew Togo because his daughter has been there. Where Togo is that green country there um, on the on the left, in the giant big pocket on the far left, and Rwanda is the tiny little dot in the middle there in the red. Um, the blue is where I was born. I was born in the Congo in the refugee camps there. Uh, and the yellow is another country I spent time in that I didn't talk about much. It's called Kenya. Uh, we've lived in eight different countries growing up because of the nature of our um, our not having a nation, really, as refugees. And uh, the next photo um, on the slide here is um, is an actual picture in 1994 of Rwandan citizens migrating from Rwanda into Congo. My family did this walk. Um, just try to try to look all the way where it ends. It just doesn't. Um, this walk people did uh, for weeks. My family did it for two weeks. And this is an actual picture um, in July of 1994 uh, taken by a French journalist um, that I tracked down. Um, my mom did this walk while she was two weeks pregnant with me. Uh, eight months pregnant with me. Uh, Pardon me. Uh, she, she walked for two weeks. Uh, she was eight months pregnant with me. I was born a month later. This is one of the many reasons why she's my hero. She did it so I would be here with you today. Eight months pregnant. Um, I can't wrap my head around that to this very day. And, and number five is where I was born. Uh, that's uh, that's a refugee camp. Um, this is what uh, many of these places look like. But yeah. Um, Thank you for allowing us to go back around there since we had the picture. Uh, oh, number seven. Okay, I guess we'll go there. Uh, <laughs> uh, number seven is my my home. This this was a major upgrade from from what we were born into. This this room here was our entire house. This is the room we weren't allowed to uh, park our you know our cars because there was not much space. <laughs> Mom and Dad would sleep on the floor and we would sleep on the on the on the mat down there. Uh, mostly because we had only ever really known just the hard ground. Sleeping in beds felt like we were sinking. Uh, but sometimes there'd be these lizards that would be out and about trying to cuddle with you. So we would hop in bed with mom and dad. And by the way, can anyone tell which one I am in the picture, though? Yeah, that's right. I'm the cute one in the middle. Yeah. That's me there. <laughs> and like always, Patrick and Fidel flanking me on either side. Uh, but yeah, that's that should do it. Great. All right. Yeah. Anybody else with a question? Yes, sir. Does it ever get cold in Africa? Not as cold as Buffalo, New York. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Great. I've been to Buffalo. Yeah. Have you? <laughs> yeah, uh, no. Um, no, it uh, uh, some places in Africa might. When you go further north, in the, the likes of Algeria and Morocco and Tunisia, uh, and perhaps even further south uh, towards the Zanzibar, the Tanzania, the Mozambique, you, you can get a little cold. And by cold, I mean, you know, the, the, the high 60s, you know, <laughs> low 70s. Uh, but Buffalo, we're, we're no strangers to negative 30 temperatures in the winter. It's insane. Wow. Yeah. Anything else? All right, we'll do some. Let me let me do this as we get ready to close tonight. I want to pray for you, and uh, and for the ministry of Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child. 
uh, just to let you know, uh, you've already challenged so many in this room to double what we did last year. And as a church, that's what we've done this year. We're trying to do uh, double the shoe boxes this year, 700 this year, uh, double from what we did last year. And so thank you for that challenge. And I hope and pray that uh, as a body of believers, we will rise to that challenge. And I think you have challenged us tonight in a way that... uh, that we should be able to meet that challenge. I appreciate that so very much. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for affirming the challenge in my very own life as well. Thank you so much for for for, for saying, for taking the time to say those words. Me, yes, Miss Nana, all of us, we appreciate that truly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to pray, and as I get ready and we, we end, we're going to all turn and stand and look to- back toward the guys in the booth and wave bye after I get through praying, okay? <laughs> so let's bow for just a moment. Father, I want to thank you for this evening and our time together, Father, for for Dusame and, and Father, the blessing that he has poured down upon us tonight. Uh, Father, what a wonderful testimony that he has, Father, but it's a testimony of what you've done in his life. And Father, what a blessing that is to know that whether it's here in America or any other country or halfway around the world, Father, that you are at work every single day. Uh, And, Mm -hmm. Father, that you can take little things, a little notepad, a a, a box full of school supplies. Father, you can take the blessings and the things that you've put in our lives as well to, to move mountains, to make a difference, to change lives. And so, Father, I thank you. I, I pray for the... Operation Christmas Child, I I pray that with all the things that have happened in the world throughout these last year and a half, Father, I pray that this may be their best year yet. Father, that churches and individuals and other groups may come together and put together more boxes, Father, than they've ever put together before. I pray that will be true for our church, Father, that we've we've got a goal to meet, but, oh, Father, what what it would be like to surpass that goal, to do more, Father, no matter what we do, we can never do enough. We can never meet uh, and come close to doing what you have done for us. And so I pray your blessings, Father, tonight on our church and our church family, Father, on those who are watching online and, and sharing with us through this time together as well, Father. Uh, for Dusame and others who are on this Zoom call with us, Father, just may your will be done. May your blessings be upon all, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So y'all stand up. Amen. Let's all give a good wake. Can you, uh, see you later. Hey, see you guys. bye <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to take a screenshot of that. Keep on waving. Keep waving, yeah. There you are. <laughs> ah, what a beautiful sight. Thank you guys for yes, having Yes, sir. Us God so bless. Much. Thank you. Appreciate that. God bless mm, you. Bye-bye. All right. I just want to say that he did a great job in explaining about Operation Christmas Child, how the evangelism and the multiplication and discipleship of these uh, children are. So I'm.